No bother at all. But uh, Davy, thank you so much for uh, coming on. No um, it's, it's a pleasure to to speak to you. We've obviously been in contact back and forth, uh, trying to get a suitable day and time. So it's good to finally see and speak to yourself. Aye, yeah, likewise. <laughs> but uh, before we get started with all the music chat, how are you doing, Davy? You doing okay? Doing good, aye. Yeah, everything's going fine at the moment. Yeah, well, good, that's no good. Complaints. What we like yeah, to do is, uh, sorry, say that again. Ah, uh, it's just busy. Everything's getting a bit hectic now. It's just that time of year, you know. It's starting to go a yeah. bit bad, but that's a good complaint. The weather starts to get a bit better, and the gigs start to go up. Do we start getting? Uh, well, more... I don't know. In the Highlands, it's blowing a gale here today. One minute the sun's <laughs> out, the next minute it's pouring down. You know, it's fine, uh, fine Scottish summer. Ah, uh, exactly. <laughs> well, if it makes you feel any better, it's the same down in the central belt. Ah, uh, ah. T- oh, just that typical. Uh, that does make me feel a wee bit better. <laughs> I, I, I've got a funny feeling if you were to speak to anybody anywhere in Scotland, they'd probably say the same. It just seems yeah. to be, you, if you, you'll be lucky if you get a day of sun and then it's just rain again. But uh, what we're going to do, David, we're going to talk about all things music for yourself. And we'll talk about the band as well and, uh, and what the plans are for the future. But what I like to do with everyone is go back to the very beginning. So for yourself, Davey, where were you originally brought up? Yeah, I was uh, brought up, born and bred really in, uh, in Russia, in Regordon. Well, I was born in Dingwall, at right. uh, yeah, Dingwall Hospital, but lived in Regordon most of my life. Cool. And see, when you were when you were a wee kid growing up, were, were you exposed to music? Were you into music from a very young age? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, music was... Music was always around us in our house, you know. It was like so. Was it with the mum and dad that were uh, that had the music on? Is that kind of where you got your early influence from? Pretty much. I mean, like Saturday night would be sort of music night. The the records would come out, and you know, my dad would have a wee drum, and my mother would have a glass of wine or whatever. And yeah. The old uh, the old wooden radio gram would get opened up, and all the old records would come out. You know, all the Hunt Williams records, uh, Johnny Cash. All the candy yeah. stuff, and then, then after a few drinks, all the, the Irish stuff would come out, and the Dubliners and Punksy and stuff like that, and some of the old Scottish songs as well about the Corries. And there was a fair sort of grounding in music there, you know. So, what about yourself? What age were you? Where, like, there's a lot of people that have been on, and a lot of it, a lot of people have the same sort of start. So it's, it's normally their parents that have music playing in the house. Yeah, that's a real influence, but. Um, a lot of people will get to a certain age and they'll discover their own musical taste. Was was it that the same for yourself? Like what what type of bands did you start to discover that was for your own? It wasn't something that your parents had exposed you to? Yeah, pretty much. I, I think in the 70s it was like the, the sort of glam rock thing and all that. And that kind of kicked off. That was the stuff I was hearing on the radio that kind of inspired me at the time. You know, like T-Rex and stuff like that. Slade. Yeah. Or whatever, but the first major kind of thing that really kind of rocked me to the core was probably in about primary six or seven when the first time I heard The Clash. Right, okay. One of my mates took his ghetto blaster into school and he says, listen, listen to this, and he had a tape yeah. on him. It was Clash City Rocker, I think it was a song. I remember we were in the gym hall and him and his other pal, they were at Pogoing and stuff. And I was like, oh, yeah. amazing. That just instantly kind of hit me, you know? And that was my it's first amazing. departure away from country and sort of folk music. Then, yeah, you know. it's amazing when something like that happens. See, when you like for me, it, it was um, something similar. My friend came down to the house with a cassette tape copy, and it was um, a metallic album. Yeah, I, I, I had no idea, you know, about heavy metal or rock music. No idea who the band was, but I'd never heard anything like that before. And yeah. it was just something something connected. And, yeah. uh, you know, well, I started yeah, to show me. Years later. later. It's 30-something years later. It's, it still connects. It's yeah. it's cool something like that happens. And, um, but give us a wee laugh. And do you remember, what was the very first album or single that you ever bought with your own money? The first single I can remember was and I didn't even buy it from a shop. I bought it with one of my pals. That, that this guy that I knew it was in my class. He was quite well off, and his parents 
used to give him loads of pocket money. So he had every record that came out. And I remember yeah. it was Jilted John, but Jilted John was the first sing- single that I bought. I don't know, do you remember that one? I'm a, probably a good bit older than you, but yeah. it was one was that a- Gordon is a moron was, was the big, so. Was that an LP? Yeah. No, that was a single. Single, right, okay. And then um, what, was, what was... What was the first ever, um, like, professional concert that you ever attended? Well, that was that was a 20... I even remember the date of this, which is strange, because I've, I've got five kids, and I find it hard to remember their birthdays. <laughs> but the rest of my life, I remember the, the 20th of May, 1980, and it was uh, Stiff Little Fingers at the, at the Ice Centre in Inverness. Right, we, okay. we, we never got big bands coming up to the Highlands. You know, we used to listen to them with John Peel. We were yeah. kind of camps in school. You were either a Jam fan or you were a Stuff Little Fingers fan with a sort of group that yeah. I like. And uh, I, I was always a big Stuff Little Fingers fan. And then it was unbelievable when they turned up playing in Inverness. So that was my first ever gig. I've got a friend who's a huge uh, fan of the band. Yeah. And, uh, and he, every time they come to Glasgow, he's off to the Barrowlands to, to watch them. But he's friends with the, with the guitarists, so they always meet up for a drink beforehand and, yeah. you know, catch up on old times. But uh, there's a few people I've mentioned them that have been on the podcast. But uh, was it all those types of bands? Was that, was that the types of bands that me, made you pick up the guitar? Was the guitar your first instrument? Yeah, yeah it was, yeah. I was probably... Primary seven when I got my first guitar and it was myself, a good friend of mine, Gordon Buchanan, and he we were in the same year in school and we shared the same, same interest in music. And yeah. our folks both got us a, an acoustic guitar for Christmas. It just happened. Just it was just a wee cheap plastic strung acoustic thing, you know. And so instantly yeah. we, we said, right, that's it. We're going to make a band, you know. <laughs> learn a few right. chords. And remember the first thing I learned was the, the Apache and House the Right. House the Rising Sun, and then <laughs> yeah, and it was just. Well, uh, did you go to guitar lessons, or you are you self taught? No, I was just totally self taught. Got started off with a chord book, and, and back in those days, it was quite difficult because you were playing along a, a lot of the time with your records, and and just yeah. going with the speed of the record, they were sometimes slightly off tune, so it was really difficult yeah. as well to catch on. You know, it's funny back then though because I I was. Um, I've been talking to different people and, you know, there's a lot of things said about technology nowadays, but one thing it's, it's brilliant for is if, you, if you're a teenager and you, you want to learn to play the guitar, there's probably never been a, an easier time to, to do it. I mean, agree, you, don't even, yeah. you don't even need to go to, um, to get lessons off someone because you go onto yeah. YouTube oh, and yeah. you've got millions of people teaching you how to play your favourite songs and uh, I mean I grew up uh, the internet didn't come around until I was already left high school I was like probably about 18, 19 when the the internet hit Yeah, you know learning, getting a guitar when I was 10 you know again I I got some lessons but it was that thing um, trying to learn by year, you know it was difficult yeah it was I don't know if it was the same for you, but I remember the big, back when you had music shops, you would go along to a music shop, you would go in and you would hope that there was maybe like a, a section where there was the books, but yeah. I didn't read music, so I had to hope that there was like tablature down the bottom mm-hmm. that you could figure out where to put your fingers. And obviously over time, you've got friends and you play, start bands and people show you bits and pieces and you yeah. figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. It was so much more difficult back then but at the same time, if you wanted to learn, you really, really wanted to learn because you had to spend the time doing it. Oh, definitely, you know, yeah. It, it's yeah, a it lot easier. And it was probably a lot slower a process to learn as well back then, you know, because you were just kind of bouncing off what your pals were doing and and yeah. just, it wasn't like now. We didn't have kind of YouTube at our hands where you, when I called the WhatsApp guy, hey, what's up? And they show you how to play anything that's, you know, anything you want to really. Yeah. It's not for so, recording or anything. It's unbelievable, you know. Yeah. Kind of just there, you know. But at the same time, it is brilliant. You know, I've got a wee home recording set up and the amount of times I've gone to YouTube trying to figure out how to do something and you've got all these people totally. offering you and suggestions and, 
You know, I, see if I'd had that when I was 12 years old. Oh, my mind would have been blown. Aye, it would have been a different... It would have been a game-changer back then, I think, you know? Yeah, but... Um, yeah, at least. So you, you got your little cool acoustic guitar, started to learn the, the guitar. Yeah. When, when, did the, when did singing come into it? Kind of almost straight away, I suppose. Or more of <clears throat> kind of had to sing to, to learn these songs, you know, but I, I never kind of saw myself as a singer, so I was always really... The guitarist, even the early bands that I joined, I kind of was an early couple of punk bands with my friends, and I was never really a singer back then. I was always kind of in the background playing a bit of lead or a bit of rhythm guitar, really. You know, I never kind of saw myself in the singing role of the front band. I was kind of too shy for a start. Because you know? I was going to say, that singing's always a funny one because if you play the, the guitar, the bass, the drums, whatever instrument it is that you're playing, you can learn that other people can show you bits and pieces and you pick things up as you go along. But singing's always the one instrument that yeah. you can, can learn things, but you can't learn confidence. You've either got it or you don't have it. You can't teach someone confidence. And a lot of singing is confidence. I mean, there is, yeah. you, you have an ability, especially to listen as well. But... Um, you know, a lot of the time people, it's whoever's bravest to sit, stand in front of the microphone. You know, we need a singer. That's, so who's that's pretty much it, yeah. You've hit the nail on the head there as well. And a lot of the time, the guys that were bravest weren't really the best singers either. They were just there because they, they wanted to, they wanted to it's do almost, that their front, you know. Back when you were starting out, it's almost like you didn't need to be technically great see you could get away with so much even nowadays you can get away with so much yeah. for just confidence I think I think that's how the punk thing captured dead so many people as well you know it's that whole DIY aspect of it that, that gave everybody that hope that well anybody can do this you know yeah yeah but um, obviously if we fast forward um, Rhythm and Real when did that band start I must have been in the oh, kind of early mid nineties. I'm terrible with dates. I've got a memory like a sub when it comes to dates, but I would guess maybe ninety three, ninety four. I would think. Right. Yeah. And, and how, oh, sorry, are, you, are you talking about rhythm and reel there? Yes. Oh, sorry. Well, I've I've only actually been in rhythm and reel for about three years. Myself and my son joined, but there always been a band that we were aware of. So I was in a band, way back at the time, a band called Konya, which was yeah. a very similar kind of band. It was a kind of Celtic rock band. Yeah. It's funny, back in the time when I was with them, uh, our, our fiddle player, uh, Debbie Ross, she was our fiddle, away back, our fiddle player away back in the Konya yeah. days. So it was kind of funny. So got into the whole Celtic thing away back in the early 90s and kind of took yeah. it from there, really, and just the whole, the whole music. So what about... So you've been in Rhythm and Real for approximately three years. So how did that yeah. come about? That was kind of over lockdown, really. And it's uh, Debbie was through here doing some recording, actually. I was doing one of my own recording projects, and I invited her through to put some fiddle down for me. And okay. there was actually a drummer they were looking for, so myself and my son, Sam. He yeah. was probably about 16 or 17 at the time. And... She says our drummer's actually left and he's leaving at the moment and we're really looking for a drummer that would love, love if you would come and play, you know. And yeah. I was going, oh, well, I'll be without a drummer. And she says, well, we could do with a singer as well because Andy, who was the singer, I mean, Andy was a guitar, a phenomenal guitar player. He played uh, lead guitar with Wolfstone for many years, you know, but Andy was yeah. kind of forced into the singing role with the band. But as it transpired, Andy was happy to to concentrate more on his guitar playing and they really wanted a sort of front band singer as well, you know, so it just kind of worked out fine at the, at the time. So myself and Sam both joined joined the band pretty much on the same day. So talk us through, who, who's actually in the band in the current lineup? Talk us through who plays what. Well, there's myself, I, I'm, I'm guitar and mostly acoustic guitar and singer. Yeah. You know, Provide a lot of the songs for the band as well, and the songwriter of the band, and my son yep. Sam, the drummer. And we have Andy Murray on electric guitar, and mm -hmm. Scott Murray, no relation, he's he's the piper. 
<laughs> yeah. And uh, Mike is a bass player. I spoke to Mike quite a few times. And yeah. uh, Hoggy, he's, he's the saxophone player. I'm trying to remember. I think that's everybody. And obviously Debbie on, on fiddle as well. So you you bet you also met there that you're the probably the main maybe the main songwriter for the band. So yeah, uh, how how does the band go about writing songs? So I, I don't know if you've got a method. Do, do you, for example, go away by yourself and write the skeleton of a song and, and take it in with everyone then contributing to build it from there, or or is it? Or do you just meet up and, and simply jam? How do you go about writing a song? Yeah, kind of, kind of more recently, it's, it's you know, like, well, when I joined first, they, they, they kind of were looking for a songwriter for the band, really, because before that, they were doing a lot more functions and weddings and stuff like that. Yeah. As much as they did festivals, they kind of progressed onto that kind of place where they, where they wanted a songwriter on board so they could start doing some more original material. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the songs that, that we added to the, the repertoire when I joined was kind of stuff that I had written already, and it was stuff that was kind of almost ready made for a for a sort of seven piece Celtic rock band, I suppose. You know, the stuff just seemed to work yeah. perfectly. But when we got together to, to work on the songs, as much as I came out with the kind of lyrics and the structure of the song, the band kind of would all have their own parts that you know. That I'm assuming. You trust each member enough that you know that what what they're adding to it is only going to make it better and elevate it to the next level. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, that, that that's the way we kind of work it. We we had the luxury, I suppose, at the time I was getting into the whole recording thing here as well. So it's yeah, it was just a kind of ongoing thing. We could kind of work out parts as we were kind of laying it down. It was quite a nice way to work. We had the luxury that we weren't paying for studio time, so we could kind of sit here and work out many different parts and then decide after, you know, and listen, well, that doesn't work, this does, you know, yeah. so it was, it was a good way to work. Well, well, talking about recording, how does the band um, record? So, for example, there's a lot of bands will start with the drums and then they'll overdub everything, bass, guitars, so on. But there'll be some bands that will maybe record the rhythm section live yeah. and then they'll do or dubs, is there a is there a preferred way that rhythm and reel record? Well, the way the way we were doing it lately was I I would lay down pretty much the the nuts and bolts of the song with an acoustic guitar and a vocal, and I would right. lay it down to. But you can see a click track, but I would use I've, I've got a program called Easy Drummer, so I would lay things down to a kind of straightforward drum track. Okay, and, which then allowed the drummer to. Sam will be down in the studio, we've got a sort of drum room down at the bottom of the garden, which really annoys the neighbours. But that, the way we would do it then, Sam would play along to the, the skeleton track, really, and lay down a solid foundation on the drums. Then everybody would just come in after that and start laying their parts down from there. And it's not always the way bands do it. You know, everybody's got their own kind of system, but the system just seemed to work really well for us. Yeah, I mean, I mean getting into the studio, you know, and it's like in the past been kind of used to the whole band playing, and you just kind of t take the drums, but that can be quite tricky too because if one person makes a mistake, they can kind of ruin yeah. the whole trap and send you right back to the start. So it's yeah. in a lot of ways, it's kind of easier way of doing things. I mean, the, the beauty of it is, is that there isn't a right or a wrong way. It's just whatever works for yourself exactly. it, it is. That's it. The way to work in a rule book, but, really, I suppose. Yeah. But uh, here's a question then. You've obviously done lots and lots of gigs with this band, previous bands. Yeah. You've done a lot of uh, writing and recording. Is there one that you prefer over the other? See if you had to pick what one, you're only allowed to do one. Yeah. Which one, which one would you pick? Well, as regards to different lineups or different. Things you mean like well, someone just said to you, right, Davy, from tomorrow onwards you're only either allowed to write and record songs or you're only allowed to play live. Which one would you play? Oh boy? That is difficult. <laughs> I think I think ultimately the playing live thing is what really inspires you to, to write and record in the first place. So I think it would have to be the, the playing live. Yeah. I still love it. I 
there's there's not a right or a wrong answer. There's there's people I've had on previously that have actually said the opposite. Yeah. That uh, if they had the money, they would happily just write and record all the time. Yeah. But uh, there's people that they kind of fall in. It's fifty fifty. You know, they they, they love both. I and think it probably can... is fifty fifty. I mean, it's the whole creative process of writing and just starting with a kind of a notion and an idea and watching it build up. You know, it's just amazing watching kind of something creating something out of nothing really or just a grain of an idea and then actually taking it onto a stage I think is like the ultimate kind of part of that you know being able to perform it live How, how do you go about songwriting? So for, so for example David you know I'm a musician I write songs right now for me personally it's always the guitar and I'll have a, a vocal Melody. I won't have any words, but I'll have some sort of idea. Just a very, very basic verse, chorus, maybe a bridge section, and generally I'll build it from there. But it's funny because the amount of times I'm out in the car and I'll be have the radio on or I'll have the music on, and there might be you might turn a song on it, and it'll be halfway through a, a through a line in a, a verse or something. And there, there might be just something that catches your ear. It may only be about three seconds of the song. That alone can inspire me to write an entirely new song. And yeah. the song that I write, it won't sound like that song. It won't be anything about that song. But it's just that wee snippet that you hear. It might be a guitar riff. It might be a wee melody. It might just be like a lyric. Something that just something triggers in your head. Yeah. And it allows a new song. How, is it, how does it go for yourself? To be honest, it's very similar for myself as well. I mean, I'd probably say 85, 90% of the time, but that's kind of how it is for me as well. I'll just be sitting right there with a guitar noodling about. Yeah. Be, maybe a wee chord sequence and then a kind of singing melody comes in there, you know, and, and maybe just even one lyric and you just keep singing. Sometimes it's just a load of nonsense you're singing, you know. And, and Back in the day, I used to have a wee dictaphone thing as well, which was really handy. And I, would, I must have hours of these wee tapes, you know, the wee see dirty tapes with ideas on them. And and now just I use my phone for doing that. So I always try and capture the grain of the idea on there because the amount of times you say, if you're out and about, you get an idea and you think, I'll remember that. But most of the time you don't, it's gone. It's just are you, it goes as quick. Are you always music first? Lyrics come last, or do you occasionally write yeah, pretty words? Pretty much, but I have. When it hasn't been like that, it's always been poems. I've written a few poems over the years, and they've sometimes turned into songs. Sometimes I put music words in the poem, but in a word book. So it's mm-hmm. nearly always, most of the time, it's music first. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Uh, so I know obviously you, you were up at the, you were playing the Pete and Diesel Festival. That's right. And, uh, yeah. That was just a few weeks ago, I think it was. Yeah, just two weeks ago, yeah. Just... Yeah, and uh, he's obviously prior to that, you had supported the guys when you when they were doing their uh, their tour. So how how did you come across the Pete and Diesel lads? Uh, just a combination of things, really. Uh, uh, their their kind of manager Robert Hicks. I've done a lot of work for him over the years, and it was him that initially invited myself and my son Sam to come and do the support with the guys. You know. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Since then, first time I've got to know Boydy very well, the singer as well. He comes along to a lot of the, the sort of smaller acoustic things that play up. And there's, we've got a kind of group of friends, uh, a, a load of musicians that we kind of gather together and we jam out now and again, have a bit of fun. And yeah. started in a wee place over in Mon- Lockie. And Boydy yeah. quite often pops, pops over there for a few nights, stays there, and hangs around. So. Yeah, a good bunch of lads. So, David, we're obviously st- still almost halfway through 2024. What is the plans for the rest of the year with regard to the, yourself and the band? Just more of the same, just trying to stay creative. And uh, I've been doing a lot more in the studio since I've managed to build it up and get my head around the whole rec- recording sort of process. So I've been doing... A lot of work for other people as well. I'm recording an album at the moment for a Scottish duo called Shahalian from Inverness and nice. just done some stuff, a, a wee EP for Lisa Mulholland, so, and then still working on a lot of my solo stuff as well. 
and yeah, just getting more ideas for the band stuff. So we're, we're, we're working on a few tracks for the band at the moment as well. So we've got about three tracks that are just about finished that we're going to kind of release over the, the summer. So we're, we're more at the stage. We're trying to think of ideas for a video for those tracks at the moment, which is kind of one of the tricky things as well. The main, the main obstacle then is just trying to find time <laughs> to, to yeah, fit it all in. That's, that's, you've hit the nail on the head. It's trying to find time is the main thing, really. In between the right. Davey, we've obviously been quite serious up to this point, talking about uh, music and all the, the technical side of it. Before we finish up, I'm going to ask you some fun questions. Right. Okay. So imagine you could go back in time, anywhere in the world. What's the one, either big concert, small gig, it's up to you. What's the one concert you wish that you could have been in attendance to see it? Whew. I think I'd Woodstock. I would have to go back to Woodstock. Yeah, that would have been cool. At least it hit me side of me there, you know. Yeah, I would have yeah. loved to explore that kind of side of things. Um, yeah, that would have been cool. Here's another one then. So, as you know yourself, there are millions and millions of amazing, great songs that have been recorded over the years by great artists and bands. What's the one song that that you would love to have had the chance to sit in the recording studio and witness it actually being recorded? Wow. Wow, that's another difficult one. I suppose maybe some of the early Dylan recordings have blown me away. I mean, I was quite a late comer to Dylan, but I started to get more into my songwriting and I realised the kind of power of what he did, you know? So, I don't know, something like Rolling Stone or Don't Think Twice, it's all right. But even a, a song that I always thought, oh, I wish I'd written that, Stairway to Heaven, you know? It's cool. I, I, I always wonder, these people in the studio recording it, I mean, there's no way they could have known at the time that the song was going to go on to become what it became. Exactly. You know, to them it was probably just the next batch of songs that they had to write and record in order to get themselves back to the road. But uh, there's so many amazing songs over the years. Oh, and that, that's the thing that blows my mind as well. I mean, I, I mean, when I, when I was playing music, I've never, I've never wanted to be famous or or that kind of thing. But I would love, I would love one of my songs to be, you know, taken even by somebody else. And that song, the kind of song you, you go out and about, and walk in a bar, and somebody else is playing your song. You know, that, that for me would be a major success. You know, one of your songs. Yeah. I don't think, well, t from myself, I, I wouldn't be chasing fame, but it must be a, a great feeling for you to sit at home, write a song, and then you play it to a crowd of, you know, say it was 20,000 people, with, yeah. and it mean them, they sing it back to you. That must be some that, feeling. Yeah, that, that would be amazing. Yeah. Um, here's one that might, might get one of your band members in trouble. Right, but... Uh, Imagine it's four o'clock in the morning. Imagine you've got a dead body in the boot of your car. And you need to you need help disposing of this body. No questions asked. Oh, Which band are you phoning to help you? <laughs> oh wow. Probably probably my son, believe it or not, probably Sam. <laughs> he's, he's got a, he's got a kind of old head and young shoulders, and he's probably a lot more sensible than I am. So well, there you need somebody like him because uh, <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, <laughs> that's he'd right. Be man, he'd be the man I would ask in that situation. I think he would probably know the right thing to do, whereas I would just <laughs> like, that's I fine. Drive, drive the car off the edge of a pier or something like that. Hope that would just disappear. Aye. And uh, last question for you, Davy. Uh, Mount Rushmore, who is the four musicians or bands for yourself, whether it be songwriting, whether it be performance, whether it just be the overall package, who are the four at the top of your list are just perfect for yourself? Uh, well, probably going back to my earliest influences from the country thing and folk thing would be probably Johnny Cash. Yeah. Or, well, you know, that out of all my mum and dad's records, that was he probably blew me away more than anybody and 
for me, yeah. in a lot of ways, he was the start of that whole punk thing as well. He had that kind of punk ethos way back then, before even punk was invented. And yeah. band-wise, I suppose, you'd be looking at the likes of The Clash, Joe Strummer, you know, just the inspiration there. Yeah, and that's cool. How many is that? Three. Three. One more. Yeah, Bob Dylan. It would have to be Dylan Bob. for me. He's the kind of ultimate wordsmith, so... I always ask that question last day, and I love it because regardless of how many people ask the question to, you get you get a different answer every time. And it doesn't yeah. matter what... If you, you spoke to me tomorrow, to... I'd probably give you maybe three different answers yeah. again, you know, just... That's great. But Davey, uh, it's been good talking to you. Thank you for coming on. No, it's been a pleasure. It's been nice to have a wee chat, but always good to have a chat about music with a fellow yeah. user. For anybody watching... Obviously, if they're looking for information on the band, any up-and-coming gigs, they've got uh, social media, they've got the band website, go on, check it, and um, make sure they get themselves along to a gig, um, if that's what they're up, they're into. But, uh, Davey, it's been a pleasure speaking to you, and uh, next time you're down the Central Belt, give me a wee shout, and I'll, oh, I'll come along. Hey. Excellent. Nice, nice to chat to you, and cheers. Cheers, pal, thank you. All the best. Thank you.